Okay, um, so uh, here we are again. Welcome, welcome to um, the Back to the Cell uh, study course session seven. Um, today we're going to be looking at um, the fourth remedy master and probably part of the fifth remedy master. Um, unfortunately, today or this week, rather, I'm on call for work, which means I have to. To potentially deal with issues outside of nine to five and right now i'm dealing with something so bd is going to lead us um for a portion of the class um and uh yeah so as as normal the purpose of this uh, class is to look at the text um and to um, point out and study things which we may not experience uh when we're training on the cell floor uh, in preparation for our return to the cell uh, this year um, we're, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're taking the Getty as our main source. Um, we're trying to discuss the plays and uh, the principles and the basics that we see in the text. Um, we're not too, um, we haven't spent too much time in delving into the various controversies and scholarly debates that, um, pop up. Um, that's more sort of relevant for scholars, I think, uh, it can be distracting otherwise, but we have mentioned them on occasion, uh, so far. And uh, yeah, we're just sort of um, giving our view. The main presenter in this um, study course, of course, is the one giving their view, and their view is but one of many. Um, but we hope that you're convinced by the same evidence that we're convinced by when we tell you something is X or Y. All right, so without further ado, um, uh, scholar Aaron Beatty is going to uh, begin the session today. And um, take it away, Beatty. Thank you very much, Aaron. So we're resuming the study session at the fourth Remedy Master oh Dagger. God. And on the screen here, you can see the image from the Gettysburg Manuscript, where we have an incoming overhead fendente strike being blocked with both hands, and then firmly gripping, and then doing other plays. We'll see in a minute. Looking at the other manuscript pages we have from the Pisani Dossi, a similar image, coming out with the left foot blocking with both hands or covering with both hands in order to be able to stop that dagger blow and really using your frontale structure from wrestling. And then again, even though it's less useful, the Florius image also shows this, although they've, <clears throat> here you can see both hands coming out and they're a little bit closer together, a little bit more extended and further out. Looking at the text, starting with the Getty, I am the fourth master and I perform this grapple. With a similar one, my students will hurt many men. If I turn right without letting go of your arm, I'll take your dagger away and use it to give you trouble. Moving on to the Pisani Dasi. I'm a master who covers with both hands, and I can hurt you from above or below. If I give a turn of, to my, your shoulder without releasing your arm, then in this way, I and my students will put you in great pain. Moving on to the Paris, before we look for comments and questions. Using both hands, the master may now take hold of the associate from above and beneath. I am able to injure you with a weapon. So as usual, the Florius, the Paris or the Florius is a little bit more cryptic. But that's the text that we take with the image in order to find the meaning. First of all, I'll open it up to recruits and ask for questions and comments. Then I'll ask any scholars that are in the chat to give their view as well. So recruits. Any comments or questions on the fourth Remedy Master of Dagger? No I just think it's interesting after the questions I was asking about mixed uh, armored versus unarmored uh, last week that the Paris actually shows an armored fighter fighting an unarmored fighter. That's kind of cool. That's all I've got. And that actually is an interesting context because we see in the Paris and the Florius that um, the uh, the Armored versus unarmored actually is less consistent. It almost seems to be more of a stylistic thing. Uh, same thing with the crowns and the garters. So that seems to be more hit and miss in the, the Florius or the Paris. But yes, it is interesting to, to see that uh, visually. Scholars, any comments? Nope. Okay. So here we have the cover. This is how you don't die on initial fendente strike. Moving on.
So here we have the first scholar of the fourth remedy master. And we see an upper key. So here in the Getty, they've stepped with the left foot, they've done the cover, and then they've taken the right elbow in behind the attacker's right elbow in order to be able to then push back and do an upper key. I think of this as being similar to the two-handed pommel strike in the stretto section. Here in the Pisani Dossi, they've gone further. They actually have the right foot passing through behind the opponent's right foot. And you see this as being further through the action than the Getty image. And you can see from the look on the, uh, the attacker's face, the, the fellow with the dagger, he's not happy. He's being thrown backwards, uh, similar to when you have a, a clothesline throw done on you. And here, we have to take the Florius and the Paris with a grain of salt. The footwork isn't, it looks like he's stepping inside the foot. That's, that's awkward to try to do that. It's difficult to get your left foot inside while you're getting a right elbow behind their elbow. But you get an idea of what's going on. Looking at the text for the Getty, this is a high bind that provides a good lock. I can take away your dagger and put you to the ground. I can also dislocate your arm. If you grab your right hand with your left, you would be doing the counter to my play, just similar to the counter keys that we see later, which would force me to let go of you. I'm well positioned to force you to the ground from the Pisani Dossi section, and if you don't end up with a broken head, i.e. thrown on the back of your head, you can count yourself lucky. And then the text from the Paris, or the Florius. I'm certainly prepared in order to cast you down into the earth, i.e. a throw, and I will give you many evils to your head if it remains because of courage. So, yes, he's going to throw you down to the earth and give evils to your head. Again, a little cryptic, but it seems very clear that this is finishing with a throw down to the ground. Uh, so if you complete this aggressively and the back of their head goes down onto packed earth or hard furniture or hard to... Uh, some sort of very hard substance, yes, you could you could do a lot of damage. Opening this up to recruits, are there any questions or comments by recruits at this time? I do have a question. Um, so I feel like when we're learning this uh, in class, usually we grab and then you sort of twist your right arm around the opponent's right arm without removing your hand. But in these images, it looks like the scholar has taken his right hand off and moved it to the other side of um, the Zigador's arm. And that looks f far more comfortable. Anyway, this one always hurts <clears throat> my hand. <laughs> yes, so in this image particularly, it looks like the left hand has gone down onto the wrist, onto the forearm with an overhand grip. Uh, when we try to hold on with both hands and just execute the play, there's a lot of strain in our right wrist. So you'll see people adjusting their right grip or their left grip. Um, I try to keep both hands on exactly as they are from the initial grab because then I can execute the play quicker. But yeah, there's no two ways about it. It's, it's, not, it's not fun. Some people will slip the right hand up further on to, uh, almost onto the, um, the, the fist of the person who's holding the dagger flipping the right hand up a bit. But yes, here in Amagwaf, we definitely uh, initially train this with the grab and then stay with the same grab position and then follow through. But that's interesting. You see that here in the uh, the Paris as well. The Flores, it looks like yeah, the yeah, left hand has yeah. slipped down into a, an overhand grip. Oh, I, I mean, the right hand has gone completely to the other side of the arm than you'd expect. Like the wrist, even. Because... Do you know what I'm trying to say? It's really hard, hard to say without, uh, without being on the floor. Yes. Um, so the images take a little bit of uh, interpretation in order to, to get there. Yeah. But yes, I see what you're saying. Interesting. Okay. Thanks. And this is one of the things that we, we look for in these study sessions are things that once we get back into in-person practice, we'll definitely need to, uh, to take a look at it again. Any other comments or questions by recruits? Yeah, so the the energy on this, I assume, is the the attacker um, pulling, trying to pull the knife back that gets you into That's this. Correct. Yeah. 
um, in the the tech the, the Getty text on the first play, um, I sort of envisioned that being continued with a a, um, a straight arm, an attacker straight arm as well. Is, so is that also a play that's sort of implied within the um, the fourth master text? Um, so why would you think that a straight arm would be involved? Um, is this the text of the fourth master here? Yes. This is a high bind that provides a good lock. I can take away your dagger and put you to the ground. I can also dislocate your arm. If you grab your right hand with your left, you will be doing the counter to my play, which okay, would force no, that, me to so let this is the text of the, of the first student of the fourth master that we're looking at. That's right now, correct. Right? Yes. So the in the actual fourth master himself, um, like the, the actual fourth master text that we just looked at previously, um, talked about turning to the right to conduct to, to complete a disarm. Um, okay. So would you like to go back to the previous play? Yeah, I'm. I'm I, I see a connection between the two, uh, so that that's why I'm kind of trying to. So here we can come to the block, and then later on we'll see disarms. Sorry, to the cover, and then from the disarms. So then as we go down here to the text for the Getty, and the fourth yeah, master, so there, and that, the, scrap um, the last sentence there is what I'm talking about. The If I turn to the right without letting go of your arm, I'll take your dagger away and use it to give you trouble. So even though it's not illustrated, it sounds like that's a disarm being described there. Um, that is different than what is shown in the first student. So there's there's different disarms that can be done. Uh, we'll see later on that you can take your thumb, your right thumb over top and push down, push their point towards their elbow, so a rotational disarm. We can also take our right pinky finger up and across and push the point uh, horizontally into their face. You could interpret this to say that I'm going to hold on to, keep holding on to your arm and turn to your right and then go into the reverse dagger, lock, break, and disarm. So that's a good point. That's something that we'll, we'll want to bring up in uh, in-person classes when we get back. But it's very, it's pretty vague right here. Does he mean turn to the right and then use my hand in order to do one of the disarms I'll be mentioning later? Possibly. Any other questions or comments about the first scholar? No questions. Scholars, any comments or questions? Yes, I'd definitely like to try this grip when we get back to the cell because I've always just done it the way we were shown. Where you keep both your hands on and slip your right elbow behind, and I've always found it really awkward. It is. It hurts the right wrist. The advantage is you're not letting go, so yeah. you don't have an opportunity. There's less of an opportunity for them to double up, less of an opportunity to move. As soon as you start switching grips while you're trying to do a play, they're more likely to double up and come in, double up and counter key, etc. Now, as we mentioned just a minute ago when, we, when uh, Graham asked his question, there are opportunities for slight changes of grip. Not letting go, but just sliding your, your right hand up or sliding your left hand down a bit. Um, and that's, that's where we see compromise. I also find that with an, a very wide increasing left foot step on the initial uh, block, you get a much wider space to step through um, when you're executing the play. And that makes it a little bit easier on your right wrist as you go through. Any further questions or comments on this uh, play before we continue? Okay, moving on. Here we have the second scholar of the fourth Remedy Master. <coughs> so here we have figure four. So somebody is striking in 
and we're coming, we're blocking, and then we're going to sneak our right hand over top of their elbow in order to grab our wrist. Now, this is the infamous third hand, right, where it looks like he's got a, a hand coming out of his uh, center of his chest there. Try to ignore that. Uh, the idea of blocking and then taking your right hand off the grip and coming across over top and then gripping and then push, pushing back. Here we see the right hand gripping the wrist and the left hand coming around over to grip the right wrist. I've seen this done by Bill, uh, Emma Free Scholar, uh, Bill Brickman, uh, as a reverse figure four, if you will. And here we see the, the, uh, the same action being shown in the Paris. Looking at the text. In the Getty, this is another high and strong bind, which you can easily, which can easily put you to the ground. I can either dislocate or break your arm as I please. The counter to me is this. Grab your right hand with your left, which will give you a good grapple and cause mine to fail. In other words, double up and press in. Pasani Dasi text. This is another lock that will throw you to the ground. And against such a hold, no one is safe. And then the Florius or the Paris. This movement is another to strike down the associate to the earth. Nevertheless, it is not safe because he attempts a similar playing. So this is vague, cryptic. You could argue that since we know from a previous text that doubling up is the way to go, that this is what is meant. It is, sim uh, it is not safe because he attempts a similar playing. If you double up, he'll double up, is the way I see this. But that's, that's interpretation. Recruits? Any comments or questions about the second scholar of the fourth Remedy Master? I, w I would assume from this position you could also get the other high key. The, um, the one you get from the Mandrito cover. I'd say no. With this one, you can hold on with one hand and snake the other hand through, which is pretty quick, just to duck your wrist under the back of their wrist and then grab your own wrist. The other one where you go under, you'd have to actually take the time to get your hand down and underneath yeah. and through. Uh, practically or, speaking, sorry, it would be a longer action. Yeah. Isn't it the one where you go from, where you take your right hand and grab your left wrist, but without going underneath? I forget which player that is. Eh, never mind. Yeah, so this is a reverse figure four. And the other one is uh, an uppercut in behind their arm and then grabbing the wrist from behind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments or questions from the recruits? Just uh, sorry, Aaron. Just seems from this position, like uh, this is very, like uh, just the way that he's approaching it. I guess he had to get offline very quickly. Otherwise, he's still going to be under threat. Yes, you. We train this with the large increasing left foot step. I'm going to come down to here. You see after the grab, then there's the right foot step. So I see this with the left foot as getting the hold on, and then with the this with the right foot finishing it. So their dagger is going to end up to the right side of your head. Uh, what you'll see some people do when they're executing plays like this is they'll actually grab and then tilt their opponent's wrist to turn the dagger away from your own face. So, so Aaron, I had another question. Okay. In this in this version here in the picture, it has the palm facing towards you. But um, I'm guessing there's another one of the other techniques is where the palm is facing towards the person. So in this case here, your right hand, so the defender's right hand is gripping the uh, dagger wrist, and then your left hand is gripping your forearm. So your right hand palm is facing towards you, your left hand t towards the, the, the uh, uh, out of the image, but the left palm is facing back.
and there would be no uh, uh would it is there an advantage having having your hand gripping it that way as opposed to having your palm outwards your left palm or it seems like in this picture if i'm understanding it is he's he's using his he has his left arm bracing his right and his right and is grabbing is grabbing the person's right hand who is doing the fendente. That's correct. Your right hand thumb up is grabbing their wrist, and then the left hand palm out has gone behind your opponent's forearm and then is grabbing your right forearm. That provides the structure and the pivot point in order to be able to then step through and press their hand back to apply pressure onto the shoulder. And dislocate and throw. So you're so you're basically moving into um, like from frontale into more strength kind of position. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, more strength is right hand over left. In this case, we have left hand over right, so we are doubled. Um, the main way I look at this is we're pr uh, we're anchoring the wrist, providing a pivot point with the left wrist, and then so we have two points of contact at their wrist with the right hand on their forearm with our left hand, and then we're stepping through, pushing their hand back while keeping their elbow at a similar height as their shoulder, which is the mechanic of the upper key. Any other comments or questions by recruits? Any comments or questions by, any comments or questions by scholars? No. Okay. Moving on to the next one. This one's fun. So here we have a throw. Here in the Getty. <clears throat> We don't see a dagger, so something's already happened here. The attackers come in, something's happened, and the defender has not only covered, but is now midway through, throwing the person, pushing his right elbow, and scooping his right knee to continue the throw. And as we can see from the position of the uh, person being thrown with his no head push. back, he's already gone past the point of no return. Similar, uh, similarly here in the uh, Pisani Dossi version, except here the, the attacker still has his dagger. He's very definitely off his balance and going to the ground. This is a little bit earlier here in the Flores, where he hasn't quite gone past the point of no return. So he's getting his elbow pushed and starting to have the leg grabbed. Looking at the text, in the Getty, when I executed my master's grapple, I placed my left hand under your right elbow. I also quickly grabbed your you under the knee with my right hand so that I could throw you to the ground and you could do me no counter. The text of the Pisani Dasi. I can also throw you to the ground like this, and once you're on the ground, it will go badly for you. Something to avoid. And then in the Paris, Certainly in this way, I can send you a second time to the ground. Hereafter, I myself will approve worse things to you. Uh, cryptic, but again, he's throwing someone to the ground and doing worse things. In Emma Guelph, we do our first remedy, uh, fourth remedy master, so our cover with both hands, and then we... Take our, uh, we push back with the right hand on their on their wrist as we locate our left hand down onto their elbow, and then we start pushing with the left hand as our right hand then goes down to the knee. So it's push with the right hand at the wrist to get them started. The left hand locates on their elbow to continue the motion. We lower our center balance and we're bringing our foot in as we grab the knee without bending over. You can see this fellow still is a very upright structure. He's not you're not bending down to get that knee. The knee is coming up to him as a result of the initial action. And then you continue with the knee and the step in order to continue the throw. 
Any comments or questions from the recruits? This looks right. to be on the energy when the person is drawing the dagger back, right? So if you're letting go of a hand, uh, you're letting go of your cover to grab the elbow. So this definitely works better if they're going back. But once you get to the cover and you grab the wrist with your right hand, then you can push back to start them going back with your right hand and then low and then it'll keep holding onto the wrist with your right hand as you slip your left hand down to their elbow. And then once you start pushing with the left hand on the elbow, now you're free to take your right hand off the wrist and bring it down to their, their knee. So three actions right in a row. Cover, push with the right hand, left hand onto the elbow, and then right hand on the knee. This is how we, we, uh, this is how we drill this play in Emma Guelph. Any other questions or comments from recruits? I have the exact same question. So, thanks. No question. So, to, to follow that up, what if you did try to let go? You blocked and then let go of both hands in order to try to put the left hand on the elbow. Any thoughts on what could happen at that point? The person can just back away. And, uh... Or he can double up and stab you. That would be bad. If we look at the straddle section and that we'll see later with the sword, being able to keep them constrained with your right hand on the wrist pushing back and then going to the left hand on the elbow, which further constrains them, and then right hand on the knee. Uh, for a further bonus mark, in, in addition to continuing to move them back, what else do you do by grabbing their knee? What do you prevent them from doing? It stops them from stepping back. Right? There you go. So if you're striking with a dagger and somebody's trying to do the throw on you, you could try to double up. You could try to counter push their, their, uh, their elbow, their, one of their elbows, so a fish, as we'll see later, and or you could try to step back. This play attempts to stop all of those actions. Any other comments by recruits, comments or questions? No. Okay. Moving on. So that was the third scholar of the fourth remedy master. Next we have one of the disarms that we mentioned earlier. So this could be one of the things where he said, I turn to the right. First of all, looking at the images, after the cover, so he blocks with the right hand and the left hand, and then he continues holding their wrist or forearm with his left hand. He takes his right hand off and puts the back of the hand or the pinky and pushes from left to right. Here we see more clarity. The left hand is holding the wrist, and the right hand, the back of the hand, is on the dagger. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that if you have a dagger, many of the rondel daggers were uh, flat profiled. Some of them were flat, some of them were triangular profiled. Uh, you can actually push against the flat of the of the dagger of the of the rondel dagger in order to turn it even uh, easier than we do with, let's say, our, our round uh, wooden training daggers. And then here we have a similar issue: left hand grabbing the wrist right hand, back of hand, or in this case, even the armored forearm pushing against the dagger. Looking at the text. I will give a horizontal turn to your dagger with my right hand, causing it to go high near your arm, which I hold. Then your dagger will remain in my hand as a sort of pawn, and I'll do to you what you deserve. So you can push with your right hand to turn it, it'll come out. You can grab the dagger and then you can strike them. And <clears throat> you can strike them with the, the point, you can strike them with the, the rondelle on the back, like towards their temple. Um, and he doesn't, he isn't clear. He just say, I'll do to you what, I, what you deserve, which implies striking them with the dagger in your hand. 
I will give a turn to your dagger, and in that way, it will be quickly taken away from you. So very clearly, turning the dagger and a disarm. And then the Paris. In this way, I myself coil your dagger up using the whirlwinds. Because I would capture you, whether you would prevent or you would fight back. Less useful, we have mention of capturing, coiling. Opening it up to comments, comments and questions from uh, recruits. And for me. Daniel? Anyone else? Okay. Scholars, any questions? No questions, no. Okay. So this is one of the disarms that we see here. And he's turning his hand to the right, but he's not turning his body, per se, to the right. So whether this is the, the action that he talked about earlier when he said, I will turn to the right, is unclear. Moving on. Here we have a different kind of disarm. Instead of rotating around on the horizontal plane, we're rotating in the vertical plane, with the dagger point being pushed down towards your opponent's elbow. We block the, we cover the incoming blow, we hold on with the left hand, and then we slip the right hand down onto the dagger, and then we push the point forward towards their elbow. Looking at the text, This dagger, which I am lifting near your elbow, will remain in my hand, and I'll surely use it to strike you. However, be sure to do this play quickly, otherwise the counter may harm you. So that's, that's a little bit of foreshadowing there. He doesn't say how he's going to strike, it, strike you with it, whether he's going to take it out of your hand and then try to use the point, or strike you with the, the rondelle, the back end. Uh, depending on how sharp the dagger is and whether it's sharp the full length of the dagger, if you try to hold it by the sharpened blade and strike it with the point, you could do harm to your, da your hand. If I raise your dagger upwards close to your elbow, you will feel it instantly taken from you. So this alludes to the rotation, putting the, uh, the dagger, pointing the, uh, taking the dagger point to your elbow. Now if I attempt to lift your elbow and your very own dagger, you, are, you yourself certainly will see it has been suddenly freed. Okay. So there's lifting an elbow and a dagger and a disarm. Recruits, any comments or questions? No questions. No questions. Graham? Nope, me neither. Anyone else? Scholars? Okay, moving on to the next play. So here we see doubling up, but this is different. Instead of doubling up to the pommel and pushing in, we're doubling up at the point in behind the wrist of the right wrist of the person who's grabbed your dagger arm. This is a little bit different in that it looks like you're grabbing the dagger in between the two dagger hands. This is more similar to the Getty in that the dagger is being held to the outside of the wrist, outside of the right wrist. Looking at the text, I'm the counter of the fourth king and master. I make the counter of the two plays before me so that I will mess up the hands of the students and their master with a pull that I'll execute right away. 
if they are well armored, I'll mess them up for sure. So that's interesting. He specifically mentions that this will work even in armor. Against the master who covers with both hands, I make this counter as my defense. Very simple. He covers with both hands against the frontale, uh, frontente attack. I'm going to double up and do something. Now, on the first one here at the Getty, he says, I will mess up the, the hands of the students and their master with a pull that I'll execute right away. So he doesn't exactly say what he's saying, but it is a pull. And we'll get to that in a minute. By this means, I will now speak the seek the opponent using both palms in order to defend myself, just as the master does, who seizes the companion with both hands during wrestling. So that's an interesting uh, reference, right, to a two-handed grab. And we see the two-handed grab, out of armor and in armor, stepping back and taking their head down to full iron gate, down to our hands going from a frontal, a frontale position down to a tutta volta or a waist position. So that's an interesting uh, added bit of context there from the Paris. Let's take a look again at the image. We've struck in. Somebody has done their their cover with both hands. We've taken the dagger to the outside of the right hand and grabbed the tip. We can step back with the right foot as we take, as we turn their hands down to our right, pinching the back of their hands in something similar to a wrist lock. It, uh, we can dig into the hands and that will also drag their hands and their head down to the ground. Any comments and questions by uh, recruits? Mike on. Sorry, Aaron. So from here, you can just, I guess, the best the best way is to take him to the right, right? But you could take him, you could take him any direction except left, I guess, from this position. So if we take them to the right while stepping back, that will um, cause harm to their hands, so it'll mess up their hands, specifically their right wrist, and it will turn their arms up and it will rotate their head down to the ground. It will also make it very difficult for them to try to push an elbow because we've locked up the wrist and turned them and pulled them off their, their fortitudo. Okay, thanks. Any other comments or questions by recruits? Um, yeah, I was just thinking... In all the other plays, he usually doubles up on either the dagger or closer up to the handle. But I was just thinking that this immediately precludes the uh, the disarm that he showed before. The very, very simple disarm of grabbing the tip. But you, you grab the tip in this. So That's an excellent point. Yeah. As if opposed to just doubling up on the back and slamming through. If somebody's doubling up and you double up first, and then you also... Uh, Restrain the motion of their hand. So if you've locked their hand in like this, then they can't double up anyway. And then if you cover that spot, they were going to double up. Yes, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. All of these plays need to be done with Soleritos. So you come in and immediately do this action and immediately follow through. So that before they have a, an option of getting their hand out of this painful position, you've already done damage and started to put their head on the ground. Mm -hmm. Any other comments by uh, recruits? Callers? Yeah, I got a question. Okay. So he says in the text that um, he would mess up their hands for sure. And then he says, this is in the Getty text, and then he says, if they're well armored, sorry, uh, blah, 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 I'll mess up the hands of the students. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. And then he says, if they're well armored, I'll mess them up for sure. If they were well armored, wouldn't that mean they'd have armor on their hands? And if they did, what does he mean by I'll mess them up for sure? Recruits, would you like to take a crack at that first? Mike off. So my guess there is that if you're wearing gauntlets that restrict wrist mobility, 
it might be harder to sort of let your wrists go soft and pull them out of that bind. And so you're more likely to get trapped and, and be thrown around the way that, that the uh, um, master wants to. Perfectly possible. Mr. Chris? Uh, I'd like to add on to the previous person is that perhaps there's a uh, the shape of the gauntlets has like a indentation so that it's much easier to hold the person because there's probably like a, a dip in the in the gauntlet itself where you could insert the uh, the dagger and grip them very well. Mm -hmm. Additionally, it might make it easier to break their wrist if they're held in so well. You can't possibly get out. As long as your gauntlet's not too protective. And that's your wrist. We'd have to test it, wouldn't we? <laughs> Another ideas? thought is that he says, I will mess up the hands of the students. Um, and if they're well armed, I'll mess them up for sure. There, he could be meaning, I'll mess up the students and their master sort of messing up the hands. Yeah. So that last statement could have some ambiguity. Yeah. Um, um, my instinct on this play is that it's actually about a, a clearing the hands rather than any kind of um, uh, like wrist lock or something like that. Like we've seen, <clears throat> excuse me, we've seen a couple of wrist locks already in the third master counter and we saw one in the second master. I think um, the second remedy master maybe, um, but this one I th think it's more well at least from my perspective it's more along the lines of bringing the dagger across, um, uh, bringing the point down so that you can use the dagger to um, break the double arm grip on your main wrist with a little toot um, with a little uh, volta stabile or even a little tooth volta and then once that grip is broken the dagger person is then in distance with a dagger and probably also with offhand connection to the opponent. So that puts them at a huge advantage. Um, so I, I, I have no doubt that you could mess, you know, if they were well armored, you could mess them up for sure because we know the dagger defeats armor and whatnot. And all you'd have to do is uh, break their grip. Uh, but it's perfectly possible to get a kind of a, a wrist lock maybe here. It would all depend on, on how things how things went. Those are all very, very interesting ideas. <clears throat> perhaps, perhaps not specifically a wrist lock, but a drag. Like sure. if you if you're able to hold him and then drag him into a very, uh, like where his fortitude was bad, then you can mess him up. A lot of it perhaps might depend on how insistent he was on holding or on not letting go. Um, though, of course, as I mentioned before, um, I. I think someone who knows what they're doing with the dagger is going to be more on the end of I'm never letting go than I'm letting go as soon as this gets inconvenient. So perhaps this this is exactly what you just said. And uh, perhaps be with somebody who's going to make that initial cover and never let it go, perhaps this could turn into some effective arm drag um, or some kind of a wrist lock of some, of some kind. So I, I'd, it's one of those things you probably have to test uh, to test out. But all fantastic ideas, I, I would say. May, may I ask another question? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Uh, it has just occurred to me that w what does mess up mean? Is it mess up as in, <laughs> hey, I messed you up? Or, oh, I messed up. Like, is it... Is it a violent term or a con like a confusing term? Well, it's when an Italian goes, "Hey, I'm gonna mess you up." But hey, oh, hey, hey, oh, <laughs> oh. That's how I read it. That's how, yeah. That's, that's how I always read it up until <laughs> just now. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, that's a good question. Who knows? Um, I'd have to. Uh, what's the word? Um, um, can you go into the Getty, the Getty play, uh, BD? Into the uh, the remedy master. Yeah, like into into the page in the Getty. Just just click on the image there. Right. Yeah. Just because like mess you up shows up so many times. And scroll down to the to the um, transcription. Yeah. Um, 
If they're well armored, I'll mess them up for sure. Ilse, Elofosen, Obel and Madi, Elo Gli Gustaria Senza Dubito. Senza Dubito is going to be without a doubt. Uh, some something like without a doubt. So Gli Gustaria is probably what you're what you're looking at. I I, I don't know. <clears throat> I like to think that Fear of the Very would have approved of any violent action in the fight that caused damage as well as countering your opponent's <laughs> intent. Yeah. So coming across and doing damage to the wrist while you're clearing the hands and then pushing the elbow and striking in, for example. Yeah, I'd say. Which goes back to pain compliance and strikes of malice. Strikes of malice. That's a great rock band name, isn't it? Strikes of Malice. <laughs> Man, <clears throat> hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Aaron, are you free? Would you like to take over from this point? Yes, sir. Yes, I am good to go now. <clears throat> the, I yield the floor to you. The bank is safe for another Yay. moment. All right. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, thank you very, very much, BD. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, everyone. So, we'll just give everybody a moment to um, sh sh uh, switch streams. So, I'm sharing my screen now. <clears throat> okay. So, here we go. So yeah, again, again, thank you very, very much, BD, for that. Um, just in, in quick summary, right? So we went through, we just went through the fourth Remedy Master. The fourth Remedy Master is against, a, it's most likely against a Fendente attack. Um, and this is, the, this is the case because it's um, uh, the downward blow, the straight downward blow is an attack which is insufficiently defended by Postalonga. And it is out of armor, it's insufficiently defended by the crossed cover, because it's too short. So we saw Postalonga already, we saw the crossed cover already, we've seen the defense against the reversal already, so fine, what about that Fendente blow? Right, looking back to our Back to our Dagger Senior page, what about the Fendente? Well, here's the Fendente, and here is a defense which is suited to being out of armor. And the defense, the cover, um, which you, you may have already covered, of, of course, the cover is in, actually in Frontale. Um, and uh, both Frontale and Postalonga, um, as it were, uh, well, I was going to say they're not actually Dagger posts, are they? But I'm not going to get into that controversy. They're... <laughs> It's all Abrazari, right? So the first master is in, the cover is in Postalonga. Um, the second master, the cover is in uh, doubled, uh, sorry, crossed without the dagger, uh, right? Which is this guy. The third remedy master is going to be in frontale, and the fourth is going to be in frontale. So there you go. We, we have actually done two in, two in frontale. And uh, now we come to the big guy, the fifth remedy master of, um, of dagger. Um, so let's, um, let's get into it. Did anybody have any, any, any last comments or questions about the fourth remedy master uh, by the by? Nope. Nope. Awesome. All right. We will, um, plow on. Okay. So the fifth remedy master. All right, let's take a pause here and, um, and look at this again. So, what we have here, we're, we're looking at the dagger section. We have nine Remedy Master covers in the Getty, eight in the PD. And the, the Morgan doesn't have any, and the Paris is <laughs> next to useless. So, <laughs> so the Getty and the PD. Um, in the Getty, right, <clears throat> we have the first one, two, three, four Remedy Masters with uh, where the Defender does not have a dagger, or at least not visibly in the images, okay? But all of these first four, one, two, three, four, all of them begin with a straight up 
standard attack, right? An attack with either a mendrito, a fendente, or a reversi. So, a, you know, a single blow uh, resisted by a single cover. And at the moment of the cover, you're going to get either a pass, uh, a push pull stay energy, and you're going to decide what suite of moves to do from there. Okay. Um, the astute of you should know or should have seen that we already dealt with the fendente, right? We dealt with the fendente in the crossed cover. And we saw that with the fendente, if the fendente, you know, shifts a little bit to the right, it can become first master territory. And if it shifts a little to the left, it can, be, it can become, or rather, I should reverse that. With respect to the defender, <laughs> if the dagger shifts a little bit to his left, it becomes first master territory. If it shifts a little to his right, it becomes third master territory. So even though the third master deals with reverses and the first master deals with mendritos, the second master can deal with, you know, can follow with plays from either master, right? Similar goes with the fourth remedy master, okay? Um, dagger is messy, right? So the fourth remedy master provides us a bunch of things. It gives us a couple of disarms, it gives us a figure four, it gives us a counter and whatever. And, but we also know that depending on what happens, the dagger might end up, we might end up on the outside of it. We might end up looking at our third master plays or that we might end up on the inside of the arm and we might end up look, uh, thinking about our first master plays. So the, the takeaway here is that as we build dagger theory, as we're looking at the differences in these positions and these challenges, we want to see the similarities and we want to see them specifically to reduce the size of this material in our mind. Because the dagger isn't actually 90 plus plays or whatever. It's just a whole bunch of the same shit. The dagger is really just this page. It's just disarms, breaks, keys and throws done in their, you know, logical places, given their reasonable energies, as you would expect once you understand it. That's not to say that it makes it simple to do, obviously, doing it in full speed in the right time. That's a whole other challenge. But in terms of understanding what's going on here. Right, which is our first barrier as new students, understanding what what's on offer. Right, uh, the more we can see the similarities in the actions, the more we realize it's really not that big of a deal. All that is to say that so far we've been building something similar, where we've been building on the same kind of theory. Right, we've been building on some logical principles and whatnot. The fifth remedy master is going to challenge some of those, or at least it's going to start off being very different because the fifth remedy master doesn't start off against a blow. It starts off against a grappling position. And a whole bunch of really interesting things are going to fall from this or follow from this. And then after the fifth remedy master, we're going to get into the next three masters, the sixth, the seventh and the eighth. We're going to look at dagger versus dagger, which in itself has some important differences and similarities with what's come before okay so that was just, that was just my little hype all right we're going to get into some really really interesting stuff okay let's dive into it the first master uh the the the, the remedy <laughs> the fifth remedy master begins with an action against a collar grab and indeed every as it were every scholar is going to respond to this situation Okay, and we're going to flesh this out a little more as we go, but before we begin, I just want to draw your memories back to the Abrazari section where we've seen a collar grab before. Collar, shoulder, you know, whatever. We've seen a straight arm grab before. So we've all, we already kind of have an instinct of where this is going to go, right? Um, but that being said, let's dive into it. Let's with the text of the, uh, of the remedy master, uh, Andrew, would you like to read the text? I am the fifth king and master and the opponent is holding me by the collar before he can attack me with his dagger. I can mess up his arms since the way he holds me actually gives me a great advantage. 
I can do to him all the parries, grapples, and binds of the other remedy masters and their students, which we saw. There's a proverb fitting all this. If you study the art and have sense, know that a collar grab bars no defense. <laughs> all right. So, that's great. <clears throat> so, um, first of all, there's an interesting variation in the translation. The, the, uh, Tom Leone's original translation says the opponent is holding me by the back of the collar. But his up his second translation is that it, my opponent is holding me by the collar, which is kind of interesting that that's such a locative sort of translation. But anyways, so it's a, it's a collar grab. And um, before he can attack me with his dagger, I'm going to do something. Because the way he holds me actually gives me great advantage. And I can do to him all the parries, grapples, and binds of the other Remedy Masters and their students. So, circumstantially, what attacks can this enemy give to this defender? Well, given this grip, where the um, point is soto mano, where the point is below the hand, given this grip, he can give either... Um, Mandritos, Fendentes, or Sultanis, right? And of course, keeping in mind, the Mandritos and the Reversos can go from neck to upper thigh, right? The range is quite is quite significant. Although obviously the targets, the useful targets will vary depending on if they're armored or not. My off. My gone. Anyway, excuse me. So, um... Yeah, so so lucky for us, we've gone over defenses to all of these already. We've gone over defenses against the Mandrito, we've gone over defenses against the Reverso, and we've gone over against uh, we've gone over defense against the the Fendente. So we're well set up to begin to understand what's going on here. And even further than that, we've also looked at a collar grab, and we've looked at some principles and ways that we can understand and approach a collar grab. We've done this in the grappling section, and we already know that the collar grab, we have a baked-in defense that Fiora likes against a straight-arm collar grab, or a, a, against a straight-arm grab. So, cool. We already know one play that we can do before we've even started. Uh, against the arm, much less all the defenses against the dagger. Now, let's study this problem just a little bit before we get into the plays, okay? There's two problems here in this in this position. One is actually a little less obvious than the other, or at least it is to some. Uh, this the scholar session uh, that did this in the last week really helped illuminate this. I think, at least for me, it did anyway. So the first problem, it seems, is the arm. So that arm, what it's doing functionally, is it's preventing you. Well, it's preventing you from running away. That's true, but the arm is creating certainty for the attacker if you can touch them you can feel in time and place where they are in time and space where they are right in a way that you couldn't be certain if you didn't touch them right so the fact that he's grabbing uh, the fact that the dagger person is grabbing uh, the defender is um, it's bad for the defender and again we've talked about being in distance right being in distance with the dagger can strike without a step without the defender having contact with the dagger. Well, this is what this is. He's in distance without the defender having contact with the dagger and the enemy's got contact. So that arm's really bad. <laughs> that arm's really bad. Um, and it's also in our way. If we're the defender, the arm's in our way. On the other hand, there's the dagger. <laughs> there's the dagger. And the dagger is going to come at us at any time. Now, as the opponent is right-handed, and his uh, the, the arm that he entered with is his left, it's unlikely that the opponent is going to throw a reversal. It's unlikely. Possible, but unlikely. The most likely attacks that are going to be thrown here by the opponent are going to be anything from Fendente to a low mandrito, to the thigh, right? 
So this is this is what the uh, this is what the defender is being faced with right now. The problem, and the problem being specifically, do I attack the arm or do I defend the dagger? Basically, okay. So without actually looking at any of the plays, we can already see from this position that we're probably going to have to divide our energy between the two problems. Okay, if he attacks with the dagger, what the hell do I do? Okay, if I have a moment, what can I do to the arm? Okay. The first set of plays we're going to look at in the Fifth Remedy Master are going to be to answer, if I have a moment, what can I do with the arm? Okay. Uh, also, you'll note a little curiosity for those um, bibliophiles among you, that the folio notation for this play is 38 RD. And actually, some of the plays that, oops, some of the plays that um, we looked at in the in the fourth Remedy Master, had um, they were from this folio as well, the 38 R folio. And 38 R is, of course, near the end of the book. So we were previously just at 15, I think RD just previously, or 15 something uh, RV, and now we're at 38. So it's actually the case that when the Getty was discovered, one whole folio, front and back, comprising eight plays, some in the fourth Remedy Master and some in the fifth, were this 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 page was found near the end of the book. And um, when it was dis when it was discovered, of course, all the folio notation is kept authentic to its discovery point. So even though we know or we think we know that this page belongs in the dagger section, it was actually found right after the spear section. So isn't that interesting? Right. I just thought I'd toss that in there. Anyway, let's get to the next play. Um, Here's the first scholar, a double uh, boar's tooth. Um, Beatty, would you like to read this one? Yeah. This is another way to mess up his arm. I perform this play to come to other plays and grapples. I'll also say that if I was faced with a lance, with this action, I would either free myself or I'd remove the lance's iron from its haft. All right. So, um, okay. So, as I said, um, let's just look back at the fifth just very, just very, very briefly. So, as I said, the next few plays we're going to look at are plays that are going to be against the arm. We're going to look at a double boar's tooth, which is now um, a frontale transition to iron gate, a little throw, a, um, a boar's tooth to the arm, a Santa sack, and then we'll get into some defenses against the dagger. Um, this play here is a double boar's tooth. So what he's doing is he's he's coming up with both hands on the outside of the opponent's arm. He's coming up into a double boar's tooth. And if we take the picture, he's grasping one wrist with the other. He's grasping his left wrist with his right. And what he's going to do is he's going to come up to a, a nice boar's tooth and he's going to do a little volta stabile. And uh, for putting the crux of this rotation on the enemy's wrist. And this is going to break his grip. Plain and simple. Okay. Um, he says finally, and, and then he, he's going to break his grip and then he's going to come to other plays that follow. Right. Maybe a third play of grappling. Right. Just because he breaks the grip doesn't mean he has to break contact. Right. So maybe you transition right to a third play of grappling. Maybe you go for, a, you know, a key on this side, something that you've learned from the third remedy master being on the outside of a straight arm. You know, this is time to be a little creative with your your violence. Right. Um, and of course, there's no time to waste. But after that, he says, if I was faced with a lance. With this action, I would either free myself or I'd remove the lance's iron from its haft. So what, what the hell does he mean here, right? Well, in the Getty, we have no idea. Because that kind of comment kind of floats away in the air in the Getty. 
But as it happens, the PD helps us understand that. And um, we're going to go to the sword, uh, the spear section of the PD. It's always in a weird place. I hate that. It's always it's so soon to the book. The spear section in the PD has two plays tucked in right at the end. And look at what they are. One of them is a crossed frontale transition to Iron Gate, which is going to break this, the, ha the, the, the spear point or the spear. And the other... The other is a double boar's tooth with the volta stabile that's going to ostensibly break this the spear shaft. And sure enough, here we have this frontale transition. That's the next play we're going to look at. And here, the one we're looking at right now, is a double boar's tooth. So isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Um, I said we weren't going to do too too much comparison with the other um, with the other books in this. Uh, uh, of course, we're going to focus on the Getty, but this is one instance where uh, having the PD is really neat. Uh, we wouldn't have anything but a passing sort of reason to speculate what he might mean here, unless we had those plays from the from the PD. It is isn't that cool. Uh, and for the the more curious among you, these are this is an interesting situation where if a spear point were to stick in your armor somehow, right, stick in your aventail or get caught up in something. Um, He's arguing that you can use these structures to potentially break the haft of a, of a spear. Isn't that neat? Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Next one. The Cross Smash. I like this one. I always like this one. And do, do, do. Curran would like to read the text. Here's another way to free myself, which is even better for removing the point of a lance. Also, if I strike you hard in the wrist of the hand which you're holding me by, uh, the collar, I'm sure I'll dislocate it unless you take it away. I want to also explain the counter. As the student comes down with his arms to dislocate the opponent's hand, the latter should remove his hand from the student's collar, which will enable him to strike the student in the chest with the dagger. <laughs> okay, we're going to return to this later, but effectively, <laughs> Fiori just gave us the really demoralizing, ah, no, don't look at the source uh, the source code. Um, <laughs> Fiori just gave us the really demoralizing counter to this play. Um, we've talked about demoralizing counters before, um, specifically counters that are easy to do and very effective. The fifth Remedy Master has one of them. But um, let's let's forget about that for the moment. And let's pretend the defender has a good chance <laughs> or has some really cool things to do. Um, so curiously in the text, he says um, there's another way um, which, is, which is even better for removing the point of a lance. Again, referencing something that he never returns to in the Getty, but in the PD, he does. And we looked at that. So isn't that interesting? And he says, if I strike you hard on the wrist... Uh, um, th that you're holding me by, I'm sure to dislocate it unless you take it away. Now, as it happens, the counter is for him to take it away. So, excuse me, we don't really want him to do that. But we'd love him to, you know, keep holding on to us and um, give us a chance to dislocate the arm. So, how do we rationalize... Uh, uh, where are we? Here. So, how do we rationalize what this is? So... If he takes his hand away, we're actually at a disadvantage because his connection to us is also our connection to him. And as long as we can have this connection, we have an opportunity to get some kind of certainty in the play, right? And in that certainty lies our, our defense. So if we were to be smashing down on his wrist here, we're not trying to get him to let go so that we can stop him from contacting us we're trying to um, cause him some injury so that it can set up a continuation of a play and again injury as defined by um, uh, preventing the body from working like it should uh, structurally right rather than something that can be mentally resisted like um, like pain can so dislocating his wrist would be awesome right 
The thing is, though, that when we do this play, and this is more of a lesson for the floor, but I'll say it anyway since we're here. When we do this play, our focus isn't actually to dislocate the wrist so much as, as it is to transition to uh, Porta di Ferro. Our grappling post at Porta di Ferro, where both of our hands are at our waist. A sharp transition to Porta di Ferro can, as a consequence of its sharpness, dislocate his wrist. But it also sets us up to defend the dagger that comes. Because all, um, all of our basic covers against the dagger are from Porta di Ferro. So um, even if he were to let go, as it were, if we're focusing on the transition to Porta di Ferro, and this is a very quick quick action, then we're still in a post to make a defense. You know what I mean? Um, then all is not lost. Certainly, if we were to try this and it were to fail, we wouldn't try it again. <laughs> We'd do something else. Because um, we're, in, we're in imminent danger of having that dagger come. Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah, so, yep. sorry, we're striking down with the wrists? Yeah, so we're in this sort kind of, of like a reverse position. Yeah. Okay. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, just like a reverse, uh, that one time, the one, the one cover for uh, Mandrita when you're crossed. It's like that, but in reverse. Sort of. Yeah, like, I, I kind of see it as like the second Remedy Master uh, cover kind of thing. Um, I mean, right, yeah. you know, how much to read into the picture, what, how is this best done? You know, those are probably lessons for the floor. It looks like he's, he's actually clasping one wrist. He looks like he's clasping the back of the right wrist with his left wrist or maybe vice versa, right? Where, you know, he's supporting mm. one wrist with the other so that he's going to bring them both down, supporting, supporting each other. Um, rather than say in the second remedy master, his wrists are deeply crossed. Like he's not, he's, his wrists aren't supporting each other. His wrists are kind of, uh, in the, in the air. Right. So it does seem like he's kind of brought his hands together, uh, here. Um, to prep this this transition, but yeah, if you're going to strike that wrist there, you're going to want a stable structure here. Is I guess the takeaway for us, sure. if that makes sense. Thanks. It that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, as I said, it's all um, it's all circumstantial. So whereas before we were talking about push pull stay and so on and so on, in this case, in the fifth remedy master we're more focused initially on is the arm there or is the dagger coming that's kind of our two big categories to start um not least because you know the push pull stay thing isn't going to be a factor until the the dagger actually comes until the attack comes right and until then we have this call to grab could the straight arm be pushing or pulling or staying yeah probably but it's not going to be it's not going to determine our our actions as much as that uh after a cover with the dagger okay so all that is to say the main categories of action here rather than push pull stay and before are going to be straight arm or daggers coming these last two plays have been straight arm is uh is there for that moment okay um the next play we have a throw Leg pick up and throw. Uh, Graham, would you like to read the text here? Sure. Yep, sorry. Ah, there you go. <laughs> I'll throw you to the ground like this before your dagger comes near me. As your dagger is halfway to striking me, I'll leave the grapple and follow your weapon so that you won't be able to injure me in any way. I will use you very poorly through the plays of the remedies. Yeah, yeah, I'm such a badass, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we get a fury. Okay, cool. <laughs> so what is going on here? So this guy's doing a throw. Now I'll tell you for free, this the scholars don't <laughs> the scholars don't like this one as much as the other ones. As some of the other ones. Or at least the scholars that um, were recently on the uh, the study session. <laughs> and this is because while it's true that the you know, being able to get this kind of throw uh, would be great against the dagger person it's very hard to trust that you're fine here because you've got one engagement holding his arm to you and the other engagement is against his leg, is this leg pickup, okay? Now, the traditional understanding, I believe, of how we get here is actually that with a straight, with an excessively straight uh, arm, 
the defender can actually put energy through that straight arm into the shoulder of the attacker and push them back and like topple them back a bit and that can facilitate a leg pickup it's kind of hard to imagine uh, i definitely had a hard time imagining it before i actually did it on the floor so this you might have to take my word for it with this one but the the takeaway from here is that his leg isn't going to come up for no reason right his leg is going to come up because you've overbalanced him on his back foot a bit and it's lightened the leg such that you could pick it up okay um now if you do get the leg and you get this arm you can um uh, you're gonna get to throw him on his ass and that's and that's great with a little um a little tutta volta however even fiore has not glossed over the imminent danger here which sometimes he he might he says as your dagger is halfway to striking me i'll leave the grapple and follow your weapon so that you won't be able to injure me in any way what does this mean well we i think should take this as a general principle rather than say a direct commentary in this play although no doubt that's true uh, for this play specifically but for these plays where we attack the arm right from the get-go we already knew that the imminent danger was twofold was the arm and the dagger and we only have permission time wise we only have permission to act upon the arm as long as the dagger is not imminently inbound so as soon as the dagger becomes imminently inbound we have to switch our focus and that's what he says in this play as the dagger is halfway to striking me right which is from you know a resting position on the belt or um near the in porta de ferro probably something like in la donna right probably raised high is my guess as to what halfway to striking me would mean as opposed to like from la donna halfway here i don't think that's a little too late but anyway when the dagger's halfway to striking me he says i'm going to change focus and that should fit our intuition right and that's also the case with this one and with this one and uh so on with the ones from the, that with the ones that can are the blah, blah, blah that are going to follow okie dokie okie dokie um yeah also is this the only skull that has a mullet in the whole play does anybody else know of a skull that has a mullet anyway i've always thought that's interesting he looks like he has a mullet <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't think the hairstyles are interesting fine whatever see look at this guy it's bald <laughs> all right next play um the fifth remedy master fourth scholar um renat would you like to read this one play makes the opponent let go of you if i place my right foot behind your left you will fall down for sure and if this play is not enough, I'll use the other ones to give you a taste of your own the dagger. For my heart and my eyes have no better desire than to take your weapon from you without the slightest delay. All right. Heart and my eyes. This is, this is a very Italian thing in, in my mind. <laughs> my heart and my eyes have no other desire than to kill you. All right. Um, cool. So here we go. This is a neat one. Um, BD, can you please take over? I've I've hyped it. <laughs> if you guys would be so kind, we're just going to switch over to uh, BD's uh, stream. BD, we're on um, the thirty-eight BD. My golf. Okay. One second while we bring that up. So one thing about the fifth remedy master is that you see you see wrestling, you see dagger, and you see sensitivity being used in order to determine when to go from one to the other. So I see a lot of compilation, uh, a lot of uh, combination here.
Okay, we are on 38 VB. So I think we're on 38 VD. Is that correct, everyone? Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Yes, 38 VD. There we go. Oh, that's what you see. Can everybody see my screen? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. So here we have the left, your left hand locating the wrist and your right wrist, your right arm coming down to the inside in a boar's tooth. Just for fun, I'm going to expand across the family comparison. So we see the image from the Getty, similar image from the Pisani Dossi. And a similar image in the uh, the pair, so the Florius. Graham, would you like to read the Getty translation? Sure. This play makes the opponent let go of you. That's good. If I place my right foot behind your left, you'll fall down. Wait, fall down for sure. And if this play is not enough, I use the other ones to give you a taste of your own dagger. From my, I think this. I think we just did this one. Okay. Unless this is the same, or is this the one that we? Oh, weird. Sorry, I guess we read it. Oh, sorry, I'm confused. <laughs> sorry, Aaron just read it, and I thought we did it, but I think he just read it and then switched over. So okay, let me, let me start again. <laughs> sure. This play makes the opponent let go of you. If I place my right foot behind your left, you'll fall down for sure. And if this play is not enough, I'll use. Other ones to give you a taste of your own dagger, for my heart and my eyes have no better desire than to take your weapon from you without the slightest delay. Sorry about that. And then looking at the Pisani Dasi, I choose to try this method of throwing you to the ground, and if this does not work, I will try a different play. So definitely mentioning oh a throw, and then in the Paris, I put to the test where I would at once lie you sharply on your back. Perchance I do not screw you, I will something better. Hey, Beattie, so all three uh, of these mention... Yep. Uh, Beattie, could you do me a favor and could you go to the Getty text? I may have miscopied some text. Uh, I mean, the, the actual page of the Getty. Uh, if you click on the Getty image there. Yeah. Because it is, it is similar to the last text, I agree, uh, uh, Graham. Yeah, can you go down to the text there? Oh, look, look at that. See, I didn't miscopy it. Ha! It's just very similar. All right. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> so one thing that uh, strikes oh me across God. all three versions of the manuscripts we see here is they all mention throws. Um, so the first thing they say is, yes, that'll make you let go of me. So you're striking down, you're taking that arm off of you. But then how do you get to a throw from here? You could go to third player of wrestling, you could take your right hand to the face, you could turn their wrist over with your left hand to get a lock and a straight arm and a lock, or you could do a lower key and take their head down to the ground. So there's different things you could do after you remove their hand from your uh, the collar grab. Recruits, any comments or questions? I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get how this place is supposed to work. Okay. So <clears throat> you grab me. I grab your uh, your left hand with my left hand at the wrist. I strike down to the inside with my elbow with the boar's tooth. That gets us to where we see right here. I've removed your hand from my collar. Now, on the text of all three, it also mentions a throw. I take you to the ground. So this is where, to me, the, the um, interpretation comes in. What can we do from here? We can do a strong lower key. We could do a third play of wrestling and take our right hand to the face. Or we could turn your wrist over with my left hand and get a straight arm and then uh, do the second play of wrestling, taking you down into a lock. So those are three different ways I could see of throwing from here. But it isn't clearly spelled out. It just says, I'll remove your arm, and then I will throw you to the ground. Yeah. Those all sound very dangerous. With the opponent staggered free. 
So looking at, uh, yes, looking right. at the it's image here, it's not quote in present, right? And earlier we, uh, earlier we saw him uh, feel that they would say, I will abandon your arm when your dagger presents itself. And I, I think of that as being in context across all of these plays. Hmm. So with the assumption that you can do this fast enough before you get stabbed or seriously at threat of getting stabs, you can focus on that arm. Okay, thanks. Any other oh. comments or recruits? Comments or questions? Mic off. Scholars? Mic on. So my, uh, my understanding of this play has always been that it's going to lead actually to um, something on the outside or more specifically a lower key. So um, you, you are actually engaging when Boar's Tooth with, uh, on the arm to the outside, but that doesn't mean that you're necessarily trying to get inside, if that makes any sense, right? Um, it's actually pretty easy to get a lower key from here. Again, this is probably easier to talk to, or it's harder to explain in words than it is to show. Um, but um, it's pretty easy to get a lower key from here because you create a bend in the arm with the uh, with the the attack with Boar's Tooth, and you have control over their wrist, which can help you turn uh, into a lower key. And a lower key, a strong lower key, is useful because it gives the best isolation that we can get from the dagger. And we already know from seeing the strong lower key in the third Remedy Master that we can potentially kill from the position of a strong lower key. So that's all great stuff. And this play can get us right. almost right to a strong lower key. Um, it can also um, get us to the third play of wrestling. Because we, we will remember that the first play of wrestling, we came up under the arm with a posa longa which would transition into a boar's tooth, I aiming for that arm break, but if we found our hand above the arm, we could transition directly into a third play. So once you know, we do this play, if we come down on the arm with a boar's tooth, breaking the, the straight arm into a bent arm, that makes a third play really juicy. Right? And not only that, but we have... We have uh, control of his of his arm with our with our arm as well, and we'll know that a third uh, the third play on that side is also going to very effectively isolate us from the dagger. So all of these things that we're seeing are things that we've already seen, but kind of you know used in a way that we haven't seen before, right? But it's all trying to get us away from that dagger, right? Get us some isolation. That'd be my comment there, BD. Yep. No, nope, I agree. To to build on that with the third play, you can do a mini, uh, either a mini two to volta, so uh, taking the left foot around behind, or a volta stabile, both of which would take you away from that dagger hand. Yes. Any other comments or questions? Okay, I'll move on to the next one. So that was the fourth scholar. Now we have one of the Santa sacks. Santa sacks. So we saw the first one in the Remedy Master, the first Remedy Master against a Mandrita where we had to actually lower center balance to get underneath. In this case, we turn to our left. When our provost there in Emma Guelph does this, David Murphy, he puts both hands with the thumbs up onto the, onto, to locate onto the wrist. And then as he turns to his left, he pulls. So he actually turns and pulls that over, which turns the hand over. And you actually get an impact when your shoulder comes in under their elbow or under their uh, armpit. You get a, a strong impact. Uh, as you're rotating, you also get your hip or your ass smacking it. So you've, you've got that striking into them as well. 
Uh, and you can lower your center of balance a bit as well in order to get a nice strong impact, possibly damaging the elbow, possibly dislocating the shoulder, and then doing the throw over your shoulder. So this can be uh, this can be quite uh, quite effective. Looking at the text, Andrew, if you'd like to read this one. Okay, this opponent was holding me by the collar. Before he could strike me with his dagger, I quickly grabbed his left hand with both of mine and threw his left arm over my right so I could dislocate it. And dislocate it I did all the way. This play is safer with armor than without. So a question for recruits. Why do you think this is safer in armor than without? Say incidental dagger strikes. Yes, if somebody's very quick. Man. Yeah. If somebody's very quick and they get a stab into your side or back while you're turning, that would suck. In armor, less of an fine. issue. Any comments or questions by recruits? Scholars? Uh, yeah, this is um, uh, this is pretty similar to the Santa Sack, I think, in the first Remedy Master that we saw, which is the eighth scholar, I believe, seventh or eighth. Uh, however, it's a much more slick one. It's much faster because in this one, you're just doing a Volta Stabile, whereas in the one in the first Remedy Master, you're actually passing into it. Um, so this one is much quicker. Um, though you better make sure that you don't screw this up because you're kind of turning <laughs> your back to the to the guy who has ostensibly an active free dagger. So, yeah, it definitely has some risks to it. You have to choose your moment. Any other comments or questions before we move on? Okay. On to the next. This one always gets some raised eyebrows. So it looks at Very first close. glance as if you're diving towards the other fellow's dagger hand and bending right over, which is cardinal sin, where we don't give our four to two up in order to grab that leg and almost trying to push him over before he's lost his balance. So at first glance, this is uh, perplexing. Looking at the text, would someone like to volunteer to read the text? I sure. Heard. This is a sure way to throw you to the ground and, and take away your dagger. If you are in armor, it won't do you any good since I'll I'll use your, your own weapon to kill you. If uh, if we are both in armor, the art won't fail me. However, if one is out of armor and is quick, he can perform other plays in addition to this. So this is a throw in addition to be a, being a disarm. It works even against somebody in armor. But if you are out of armor, you can do other things. It doesn't quite go as far as to say you should do other things, but it does say you can do other things. So I take that to mean this is better if you are in armor, so incidental contexts are less of a danger. In Emma Guelph, we strike from left to right with the, uh, with the right wrist striking up underneath the dagger and then carrying that across your opponent's face to the left of his face so that you get to a point where you're, you're striking through almost similar to a third play of wrestling, putting him off balance and then scooping the leg. Any comments or questions from recruits? This almost looks like it could be a good play to follow on from the... Uh... Mandrita deflection defense with the right hand. 
Like you grab it and then just go all in for a leg tackle. Right, like it's got that same right hand position. My gone. It is very similar in that respect. Not really a question. (laughs) Any other comments or questions by recruits? Callers? Uh, Yeah, so this one... um... I think that I can't help but think that the picture is a little wonky for us, or it looks a little wonky. Um, I don't believe that there's any kind of bending over with this one. I just think he just drew it kind of, he drew the the defending figure kind of low for some reason. Um, but so, so basically what it, what it kind of looks like is that, uh, the dagger came and he went cross bo- or the dagger was rising up. What it looks like to me is if we had to rationalize the picture, the dagger was rising up in front of his body to come to his shoulder. And he shot, he saw that shot right across and pinned it to him in Postalonga and then kept his momentum going and took the leg pickup. That's what that kind of looks like to me. I'd be abandoned whatever he was doing on the arm and he shot across to try and get registration on that dagger hand. Maybe when he pinned it to him, he kind of pushed him back a bit, and then leg the, the front leg lightened, and he got a pickup. But to me, this shows how important it is to get registration on that dagger once it starts to raise up. Okay, any further comments or questions? Okay, let's move on to the next play. Here we have the seventh scholar of the fifth remedy master. As it's drawn, it looks like someone who's very small defending against somebody who's very large. There is one part of one of the uh, the manuscript texts that could relate to that, or it could be that his center of balance, the defender's center of balance, is very low. Regardless, we see that Dopia and Crusada is being used, so more strength, with the right hand gripping the left wrist, <clears throat> coming in to block to the inside of the wrist of the dagger hand, and then doing other plays. Andrew, would you like to read the text? This parry is excellent both in and out of armor, even against a strong man that can parry both underhand and overhand. This play enters into the middle bind, that is, the third play of the first king and remedy of dagger. If this parry is performed underhand, the student can place the opponent in a low bind, i.e. the strong key. This action is under the third king and remedy, who plays from the reverso side in the sixth play. So first of all, we see this is good both in and out of armor. When we look at the dagger posters, the the crossed, doubled and crossed posters are strong, so they're good in armor. And it says, even against a strong man, it can parry. So here in the drawing, where he has a large individual, it seems, against a shorter individual, that might be a that might be a reference to that. If I have someone coming against me who's taller, who's stronger, who's heavier, who maybe he's in armor and that adds some weight as well, that might all be uh, alluding to use a, a doubled or a doubled and crossed poster. The text specifically says that you can do a middle key against an overhand attack, so block and then go into a middle key in this case. And even though it only shows an attack from above, the text also mentions that it's good against a Satani, against a lower attack. And then it says you can you can go into a strong uh, a strong lower key. So a strong key.
interestingly enough, we don't see a hand grabbing the collar here because we're in the, the fifth remedy master. It's it's assumed that that's the case, and you've abandoned the arm grab, and you've gone straight into the defense against the dagger. Any comments or questions from the recruits? Yeah, so he's basically just going into one of the first remedy covers and ignoring the hand in the way. Yes, which is part of the general trend we see here. If the mm -hmm. dagger is out of presence, attack the arm. If the dagger is in presence, and here we see the dagger is up very much in presence, mm -hmm. coming in, abandon the arm, do what you know. In this case, uh, instead of a Mandrita defense, doing the Dopia and Crusada defense, as one would against somebody in armor or someone who's taller and stronger. Any other comments or questions from recruits? Scholars? Uh, yeah, so to me, this one is uh, just more of kind of what we just saw before, whereas whatever we were doing on the arm, the dagger's coming, so um, we're going to come in with our more, uh, a more strength defense. And we established at the beginning that the most likely attacks are going to be Fendentes and Mendritos. The more strength defense uh, cover, as we know already, can handle adequately both Fendentes and Mendritos. And it's also one that we're going to use, um, or it's also one that is very sturdy, right? It's very sturdy, and it's also one that gets both of our hands near to the point of contact with the dagger, right? Um, so that we can start doing plays and keys and whatever so this to me just makes sense the dagger's coming in you see it you step into that open space between you with your your lead foot there coming into more strength trying to intercept that dagger and uh get a lid on it any further comments or questions Next, we have the eighth scholar. Eighth scholar. So here we have the arm being grabbed. Going to go down to the text. If I can turn this arm, I will surely place you in a, a low bind and strong key. This play is even sure in armor. I can even do other things to you if I kept my left hand still and grabbed you under the left knee with my right hand. I won't lock, lock the strength to put you to the ground. So he talks about turning the elbow, and he talks about a strong key, so a low, a low bind, strong key. So turning the elbow, getting a bent arm, and then following through. He talks about it being even sure in armor. We talked, or we mentioned earlier that if you have... Uh, if you're in armor and somebody's coming in with a dagger, incidental contacts are much less of an issue. So as you're doing this play, you could stand and take a strike in somewhere that you would not like out of armor. And then he talks about a throw. So holding his, holding the, uh, the arm that's grabbing with the left hand and going straight to grabbing the left knee with the right hand. So this is actually two plays in one. I can turn the elbow and do a low key, or I can grab the knee and throw. Any comments or questions from recruits? Scholars? Oh, I was going to say this looks... Sorry, Graham. Go Sorry. This, this just looks exactly the same as the fifth master. Is there much of a difference? He seems to be holding the arms in the same place. And... So the fifth remedy master set us up, and then here we're talking about other things you can do. Yeah. So you can you can turn the arm, you can turn the elbow to get a bent arm, and then do the strong lower key, sure. or you could grab the leg with the uh, right arm and throw, similar to the uh, yeah. fendente uh, dagger throw. 
Okay, so it's just like more stuff that you can do from the Remedy Master, just because the, the, the image looks almost identical. Yep, I agree. Yeah, okay. Thanks. I I was, yeah, I was just clarifying. Thank you. In some cases, the image shows us the setup. some cases, it shows us halfway through the action. And in other cases, it shows us at the end of the action. So the images sometimes need uh, a little bit more interpretation. Uh, Aaron Bellarino, you had a, a comment? Yeah, no, I, uh, I agree. Um, it's just more of the same kind of thing, more of the same theme that we've seen, um, different ways to get that, that lower key. Um, you know, this play also looks very much like, um, some part of the, uh, first remedy master of, um, or the, the, the first master of grappling to me, you could read it that way, I think easily. So, um, just more of the same theme as what we saw, right? Attacking, attacking that arm while it's primary. Now, one thing I'll add in addition, this is, uh, yeah, sure. I'll add it in. Um, in the past and probably still still now there is also a third little uh category in the fifth remedy master that scholars sometimes talk about and that category is whether the arm is whether the collar grab is in your center line or whether the collar grab is on your shoulder if the collar grab is on your center line it makes it a little difficult for your right arm to cross the center line effectively and engage the dagger when it comes. Whereas if his collar grab is more on your shoulder, then the center is virtually free and you're, you have no problem making any dagger defense you, you need if the dagger comes. So what that may mean is that if that arm is really in the center, not only may it mean that well, if it's in the center, you're already half isolated anyway. So you've got great opportunities to attack the arm, right? But it also may mean that you're going to try and take certain techniques that try and get you on the outside of that arm, right? Techniques like um, getting that lower key or techniques like the double boar's tooth, right? Whereas if it's on the inside, or sorry, if it, the, the, the arm is on the shoulder, maybe you'll do some techniques like um you know maybe the smash down maybe or maybe you'll just uh, you'll just ignore it and wait for the dagger attack right or maybe you'll try something else right so the point is that the placement of the arm could further help reduce the number of techniques that you feel are on offer right that's something that is a little more obvious when we're on the floor but it's something to consider right whether that arm is um, straight in your in your presence or not what really drives it home to me and i think when i was um, a recruit uh there was a couple guys in class um uh bd do you remember torben remember torben no, well, anyways, torben was very much like bd <laughs> he was big and tall and if he straight armed you <laughs> you weren't making any dagger defenses <laughs> right his arm was like a giant meaty pole right in the middle of your center and it's stopping you from doing everything and you're like oh shit what how the hell am i going to deal with this and so it kind of really brought home to me that okay you know in this situation if you're facing this you, you know maybe you really have to get on the outside of that arm maybe that's your only hope because the because of the strength and balance against you and not only that but if there is a strength and balance against you the uh, grabbing that person before you murder them is actually not a bad idea because you know that they're not necessarily going to be able to muscle their way out of you uh, and uh, you can hold you, you have a good chance that you're going to hold them there and not run away maybe even to intimidate them to not even attempting a cover you know who knows I don't know what big and intimidating people do I'm not a big intimidating person but uh, I assume that's what I would do if I was big and tried to murder people with a dagger <clears throat> anyway uh, the arm the placement of the arm it's something to think about. Okay. Um, yeah. Anyway. That's it. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions about this play? Did I, uh, did I make you out to be sufficiently intimidating, uh, BD? <laughs> it was very flattering. Thank you. I hope so. Excellent. <laughs> Okay, moving on to the next play. 
So that was the eighth scholar. So now we come to the ninth scholar. So we've seen Dopi and Krasada. Now we see in Krasada. So he doesn't even bother to attack the arm. He just waits for the dagger. Doubled and crossed. And then as the dagger comes in, he does his doubled and cross plays. I'm waiting for you fearlessly with my arms crossed. Go ahead and attack me above or below as you please. I don't care which. Since I'll put you in a bind, whatever you do, I'll lock you either into the middle or low bind. And if I grab, perform to the grapple of the fourth remedy key, King of Dagger, together with his plays, I'll give you a world of hurt. And I'll also take your dagger away from you. So we've got locks, we've got keys, we've got uh, dagger disarms. Um, essentially, he's saying, yeah, I can just go straight to here and use this. Recruits, any comments or questions? It seems like it would be pretty easy for the dagger man to suppress the uh, the defense with his elbow and his left arm. Like, if he collapsed down a bit, you know what I'm trying to say? And then you wouldn't be able to raise your arms high enough to defend the dagger. I'm just curious. You'd have to let go of the collar in order to try to come down to push your elbow. Mm. Your hands right. are low and his hand is high, as it is stands right now. So you've got that open space to the left, of, to your left of his arm, in order to rise up and come through. Right. You gotta be very sure of yourself to do this one. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty arrogant. <laughs> come on well, and stab so me. What is the what is the optimal situation uh, for this play? To for, for us to choose this play. That's a great question for everyone because we should know the answer. I think by now. I don't know BD mentioned. Recruit? That. What would be the armor? optimal hmm? You're wearing armor? <laughs> Correct. That is that is that's the right answer. Right. So if you're not wearing armor, then obviously this is big <laughs> this, why would you cover short? Why in the hell would you do that? Just cover in more strength for God's sakes, right? We already saw that. But if you're in armor, then what does Fury say? It's the strongest defense and he would choose it above everything. Blah 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 braggy blah, right? So if you were an armored, you're damn right you would choose this one. It could play on all sides. You don't care about incidentals. It's going to get you in there. Um, you know, uh, you're not going to miss, and it'll be fine, right? As as a um, with respect to the arm being in the way. Well, again, like I like I just said, that's going to be contextual, right? Your choice about that is going to be contextual. Although if you were in mm -hmm. ar in good armor. Then, well, okay, I was going to say if you were in good armor, then a collar grab in the middle might necessarily not be likely. But then again, if you had a nice aventail or something, yeah, who knows? Maybe, maybe it would. I don't know. Hmm. But I, I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't do this, even if the arm was in the center a bit. I don't, I don't see why you couldn't do this anyway. It's a pretty close cover, right? It's pretty, pretty close cover. So even if you were a little late, I think you could still pull it off. Oh, okay, thanks. But it'd be great to test. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or questions on this play? Okay, moving on. And we passed uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, Aaron, would you like to yes. take it for another 20 minutes? Or? Yes, absolutely. So um, let's, uh, what, what else do we have here? Can you just uh, go back to the... Um... Uh, can we go back to the Getty, the fifth remedy master? Yeah, let's just scroll down. So, what? How many do we have left? We have a uh, we have a couple left, don't we? Three left. All right. So let's um, let's end here. Um, we made it all the way through the fourth master, the fourth remedy master, and almost all the way through the fifth, which is great. Um, we um, we made it through the. The, the the halfway point easily of the fifth remedy master, where we changed from defending against. Of the arm, this just collar grab to defending against dagger strikes. Um, and we're going to see more defenses against dagger strikes as we go. But as we go on in the fifth remedy master, in the, the next few plays, we're not going to see anything um, really surprising. We're going to see basic covers against the dagger. And then um, we're going to transition to see 
the 6th, 7th, and 8th Remedy Masters next week, which is defenses with a dagger against a dagger. And they have a very interesting context in comparison to what we've been seeing so far. So I'm excited to get to those for sure. Um, the last thing I would say here is that the 5th Remedy Master for me is like the oh man i don't i don't know how to put it it's like the it's like the scrappy heart of the dagger section you know what i mean like it's like the the messy dirty you know not we already kind of knew what it's like but damn here's what it's like kind of you know part of it right and it's nestled right in the heart of the section be starting off with a collar grab oh man we're in distance oh man the dagger's free oh man now we got to try and figure this shit out you know it's everything the dagger the dagger is you know um you know full-on audacia um making these quick decisions as to attack the arm or the dagger uh, it's pretty great um the fifth revenue master is great to practice um in in class it's really it helps us very versatile or uh get to our defenses and think about our covers in a very versatile way um, even though it does kind of neglect the reversals a bit because throwing reversals here is kind of dumb for the the dagger person but it's fantastic to practice it gets us thinking about grappling and dagger together which is always great and um, yeah i look forward to doing it with all of you on the floor um, but with all that said uh, i think that'll more or less finish it for today we'll end off with any other questions or comments from anyone uh, BD or uh, uh, Andrew, do you have any um, last comments, questions, anything? No. So, nope. All so right. I, mm -hmm. I agree with her. This is a great stress test for a, a, a scholar or a scholar test candidate to say, all right, let's grab you by the collar and do anything you can. Dagger or wrestling related in distance especially against a larger individual yeah and and that's again something that you know it's just one of those things that we always got to keep in mind that while it's true that we we often study weapons and we study martial situations by comparing same to same equal to equal it's never the case really or it's rarely the case that that's ever truly real right where we have equal to equal right and it's more more often the case of the of the opposite right where we we look for these inequalities right um so that we can uh so that we can win so uh keeping in mind that you're learning dagger you're trying to understand how this works not just so that you can defeat yourself right someone who's your same size and your same weight your same skill level but so that you can defeat somebody who's way bigger than you right or defeat somebody who's way better than you right because the martial challenge is still the same right whether you're or not you're fighting a, a provost or whether or not you're fighting somebody who's just put on their coat and uh <laughs> i tell you this for free right <laughs> sometimes we get hit more by the people who've just put on their coat than we get hit by the provosts right which is bad right that shouldn't be right that shouldn't be it should be the opposite right but um, that's just show, goes to show you how dangerous martial arts is and uh, how much we have to pay attention, right, to really make things work, right? If we pay attention sufficiently, then only the best, you know, the, uh, the, the best should hit us and the uh, stupid stuff shouldn't. But it's hard to pay attention enough to, you know, really, really make that stick. So, yeah, but that's why it's an ever, it's a, it's a internal journey. If it was too easy, then everybody would be good at it. And with that, uh, with that said, um, I hope to see you all next week. I'll put this up on YouTube as uh, soon as possible. And everybody stay safe and stay healthy. Excellent. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much, BD. And last but not least, of course, I apologize for having to um, to uh, zip off a couple times. Uh, I uh, this is, I'm on call once every eight weeks or so, so I'll, I'll, I'm free for the next bunch of sessions. So see you no next worries. week. And okay, stay safe, everyone. Yep, you you guys too. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron's. Have a good night, <laughs> Aaron's. That's Thank great. you. <laughs>